All right, Martin, welcome. I'm very excited to uh, to have you. I, I actually don't have a name for this podcast yet, but we're here and we're doing it. And, uh, you know, we'll go from there. But um, anyway, uh, so cool. Martin, very, very, very fresh then. Very fresh. Yeah, this is actually the first the first really official episode. So, you know, I uh, I'm having the uh, the premier guest on for that one. So I like it. Oh, well, thanks. Uh, I'm honored. Yeah. So uh, anyway, so Martin Ball, how do I introduce you like author of both nonfiction and fiction? Right. Entheogenic master and really groundbreaker um, in that area. Teacher. Um, musician. Uh, photographer. Um and general, you know, a player of multiple instruments, from what I can gather from your music. Yeah. And um, and uh, also, you know, father, family man, and and um, and uh, and just a, a a guide as well, and to many people. So, I really appreciate you being here. And I know we discussed this um, this podcast maybe about I don't know a month and a half ago, and. You know, I wanted to talk to you. I think my idea is talked about something different, right? Like, yeah, what what don't you get to speak about? You know, because everyone speaks to you about you know five meo DMT and the nature of reality and all this stuff. And we'll we'll get into that because it, it it informs the conversation. But what I wanted I wanted to kind of bring it down to a practical level and talk about your music and talk about your art and talk about how that's developed for you um, over the years. And I can kind of include my own uh, view on that as well, because, you know, I'm an opera singer um, and I and I've been training at that for, you know, um, I don't know, 18 years now. And and so I kind of wanted to talk to you about that and then how your journeys right with um, 5MEO um, has actually informed your artistic development right over the course of your life. Um, so my first question actually starting off to you, which is something I kind of wanted to hit on before we got into that. Okay. Was, you know, I come actually from a very conservative background and I know a lot of people that would look at something like 5-MEO or things like that and be like, what? Like, you know, that's crazy. Like, to them, you know, like doing cocaine in a, in a, you know, in a club, you know, in New York City at four in the morning is equivalent in their mind to, let's say, uh, an entheogen um, that is used for, let's say, spiritual purposes. And now from my perspective, having actually done both, the the divide it couldn't be further so i kind of wanted to address that right off the bat because i actually think it's important to speak to people who who aren't necessarily familiar or or even open to it but maybe could possibly be so what would you have to say to that yeah well one of the things we could do is just turn to the word that you used right off the bat and this is this is a word that was relatively obscure when i kind of started out in the field of talking like my podcast is the entheogenic evolution and it's pretty regular for people to ask me like entheo like what what what's that word what does that mean and i think that it's much more commonly used these days but the word itself means generating the experience of god within and that kind of starts us off with a very different frame for what it is that we're talking about. And this is an alternative word that was introduced um, to be used uh, rather than the word psychedelic, which kind of got co-opted by American popular culture and counterculture and used to describe various forms of dress, art, and music, which often had roots in the psychedelic experience. But the word psychedelic kind of took on its own sort of cultural meaning and baggage. And so some um, researchers who were more interested in how are these various plants and substances used within traditional cultures, primarily for spiritual, religious, and ceremonial purposes, how are they being used and how is that different from sort of the um, 
uh, cultural, sometimes seen as hedonistic use of these substances within Western cultures, you know, back in the 60s and early 70s and things like that. So they coined this term entheogen to kind of distinguish, um, particularly we're talking about the same substances, but it, when used in a spiritual or therapeutic or ceremonial or religious context, then entheogen seems to be a more proper term to be used. And here even the word theo, right, Greek for God, can also be used very loosely. It doesn't necessarily mean, you know, the Christian God, the Islamic God, the 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 Jewish God. Um, it can also be used kind of as a term to just to mean sacred or holy or having special importance and significance for somebody's life. Mm -hmm. And so this is the term that gets used much more often these days of entheogen and in psychedelics. That that term is also used as well, but um, culturally. You know, they've really been lumped together with anything that isn't a culturally sanctioned mind altering substance. So, like in Western cultures, we have alcohol, which has been accepted for hundreds and hundreds of years and uh, widely available and legal if you're 21 or older, well, in some places younger, you know, depending on uh, where you're at. And we have uh, caffeine, which is a stimulant. Um, people drink coffee and drink tea and get a little pick me up. And then of course we have nicotine and then we have all the various pharmaceutical drugs and um, medications and medicines that we use. Um, and even a lot of those originally are derived from um, plant sources, you know, like aspirin originally came from um, the bark of the, what is it? The birch tree? I forget, but uh, the, mm -hmm. you know, they have their origins in the natural world and then they've been pharmaceuticalized. Um, but psychedelics got lumped in with other things like cocaine, heroin, PCP. Um, and, you know, in the United States, most psychedelics have been listed as Schedule I substances. And a Schedule I substance, um, this is regulated by the federal government, says that, uh, first of all, a Schedule I substance, substance is a narcotic, um, which narcotic really means something that puts you to sleep or makes you drowsy such as opioids are narcotics that if you take right. enough narcotics you will fall asleep um you will get numbed out uh, there are psychedelics are not narcotics in any way shape or form like try going to sleep on mushrooms like not going to happen try going to sleep on 5 and dmt not going That's to definitely happen not going to happen <laughs> yeah so they're not narcotics also, something in Schedule 1 is supposed to have no medicinal uses. And this also is a misclassification because um, psychedelics have a variety of uses within medicine and psychiatry and in therapy. Um, also, they have to be uh, highly addictive uh, in Schedule 1. And psychedelic substances are not addictive. They do not have addictive properties, which is not to say that people can't become um, uh, overly dependent upon them. And so some people do use them on a regular basis, but they don't produce a withdrawal effect if you right. stop using them. And so there is no physiological dependence. There might be an emotional or a mental dependence, but there is not a physiological dependence. So they're, they're misclassified in that area. And um, they also have to have a high likelihood for abuse. And those are all the conditions that put something into Schedule 1, which is the most highly restricted category of drugs in the United States. And psychedelics don't fulfill a single one of those uh, conditions that are looked for. But that's the way that they've been treated and described within culture. And so a lot of people have basically have... Um, had to endure propaganda around these substances and don't really know that they're not addictive, that they do have medicinal uses, that they um, do not tend to lead to addictive or destructive behaviors. And in fact, um, we now know through a variety of anthropology and cultural research um, and historical research that psychedelic substances have played a major role in virtually all the main culture areas of the world and they tend to be more closely associated with spiritual traditions ceremonial traditions and religious traditions than anything else mm -hmm. and they're now being reevaluated kind of around the world 
for both their spiritual and their, their uh, medicinal properties of how they might help treat things like depression, anxiety, PTSD, a whole variety of behavioral and mental disorders. And also potentially, um, you know, a lot of these have neuroregenerative effects. So they're looking at yeah. potentially like Alzheimer's, dementia, things like that. So the, their uses are myriad and they tend to produce experiences within individuals that serve for self-reflection and where people can come to view themselves and their choices and their life and their actions from a new perspective and therefore are very useful for creating positive change within people and also helping people resolve past traumas, um, deal with repressed motion, emotional and mental content. So they have a lot of effective uses. And so people's attitudes are changing. And especially with uh, people like Michael Pollan, you know, he wrote his book, How to Change Your right. Mind. And they made a Netflix series about yeah. that. And that has made it very palatable to people outside of quote unquote psychedelic culture who maybe have never considered this before. And now they're looking at it as like, well, th there's a certain legitimacy here because, you know, the food guy wrote about it. So there must be something here. Right. And, you know, there's, it's interesting within the quote unquote psychedelic world, there's, you know, there are some people who are a little bit might I say like bitter about Michael Pollan because here's the food guy comes along and he writes the best-selling book about psychedelics and there's other people who've been you know working in this field for decades and have never gotten that recognition and now he's like you know a keynote speaker at lots of conferences and events and other people say well he's basically a newbie and he doesn't you know he's he's experimented and he's written about it but he doesn't have a lot of um, actual knowledge or experience within this area but you know it's leaving that aside, it certainly has got a lot of people's attention. And then when they see articles in like Rolling Stone or Forbes magazine or the John Hopkins uh, Journal of Medicine, you know, people's yeah. attitudes are changing because the, the information yeah. landscape I, I is changing. For me, like, you know, the difference is I've, you know, you go into a bar at, at, at a nightclub at night, you drink a bunch of alcohol, and it's sort of like um, mind corrupting, I would say, in some ways. But you know, these medicines, especially 5-MeO, in my experience, are actually mind and body purifying. Yeah. Um, and and didn't necessarily, you know, they're not, you know, didn't turn me into some, you know, I'm this, I'm like this now. And then all of a sudden I'm, you know, off um, in in La La Land or, or become a completely different person. Um, but I mean, it it's, it's, in my mind, com two totally, you know, complete different things. I think did a good job of, of describing that. And so I know now to switch gears, kind of let's go into the cool stuff. So like your, yeah. your art, right? So how did you start? What, what started for you first? You know, the, the, the music, the photography, the, you know, the, the fractal art, like how did that all start for you? And tell me a little bit about, you know, your, your background and your process of, of, of doing this and learning how to play instruments and all that stuff. Yeah, well, first, I just want to say, you know, thank you for having me on to talk about this kind of stuff. Because as you mentioned earlier, you know, I've given lots and lots of interviews, and probably 99% of them are on the topic of, say, non-duality, 5-MeO, DMT, psychedelics, and, you know, the things that if I, I've had to say from, as you mentioned, I, I do believe that I've been rather groundbreaking and revolutionary there. And so people often want to talk about that. Um and some, I mean, sometimes it just blows my mind when sometimes people tell me like, oh yeah, I read your book and like, wow, like who made the art? And I was like, well, you know, I, I made all the art that's in the book or somebody yeah. listens to my podcast or they listen to one of my audio books and they're like, wow. And that was some cool music in there. Like, where'd you find that? It's like, you know, I, I made that, you know? Yeah. So it, when people quote unquote, think of me, they tend to think of me as an author and they don't really consider the artistic side of, of what it is that I do. And whereas I kind of more personally identify as an artist, um, kind of a multimedia artist that I tend to look at everything as sort of like an artistic project. So mm -hmm. um, it's just, no one ever asked me about it. So it's so nice to have you ask me about yeah. it. So I want to um, get real practical here. So let's, let's get into it. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe we'll just start with the artistic side of things that, um, you know, as a kid, I uh, just got into drawing. That was kind of my thing. And also, um, you know, nature has always played a big role in my art and in my music and in my um, 
you know, pretty much everything that I do. And I was, you know, I was a little nature boy as a kid that I liked to go out and catch lizards and snakes and look for birds and stuff like that. And um, so even as a, a young child, I tended to like to draw animals uh, first off, um, you know, like when I was maybe seven or eight years old, like I entered a, an endangered species art contest and I drew a drawing for that one. I do, I did two different drawings. One was of a California condor and another one was of a mountain lion. And I forget which one, which, but one of them won first place and one of them won third place. Um, and so I, you know, I liked to draw nature. I was really into it. And then a little bit later, I got into um, most of the cartoons that I liked as a kid were like uh, Japanimation, like anime. It wasn't really called anime back then. It was more called Japanimation. And I really liked the style. So I kind of started drawing people and figures kind of using that Japanese animation style. Um, and even it's funny um looking back like my mom has saved a lot of stuff and every once in a while she finds like an old art piece that I did when I was a kid and she sends it to me and looking back I could see that I was already combining certain elements that I'm still combining in my art today with sort of like spacey images and um I mean literally like space you know like outer space the cosmos I was also really interested in science and you know like the universe that we live in and so I incorporated that into my art um, and then as a kind of a teenager and in my early twenties, um, I spent a lot of time doing artwork where I would start with pencil and I would draw like a bird or an animal or a landscape or something like that. And then I would, um, trace over the, the pencil with a permanent marker and pen, and then I'd erase all the, the pencil, and then I would use my Prismacolor colored pencils to color it in. And, um, you know, didn't do a whole lot of that, but every once in a while, you know, I would be working on art that way. So I do have some drawing skills. I don't use them very much these days. Um, I mostly work in digital format because it's a lot faster and you can produce a lot more than sitting down and drawing. Um, and also I'm left-handed, which has always been a problem. Uh, well, I should say I'm, I'm rather ambidextrous. I'm kind of half left-handed, half right-handed, but I write and I draw with my left hand. And anybody who's left-handed knows that you end up smearing stuff like all over your paper when you're writing or when you're drawing, because that's you know the way that you hold a, a pen or a pencil with the left hand. So, you know, I'd have to like draw with like another piece of paper, like under my hand um, so that I wouldn't be smearing stuff. Um, yeah. And then the, the, the digital art kind of started in um, probably around 2000 is probably the year that I started doing any kind of digital art. So at that point I had finished graduate school and had recorded a bunch of music already. So I'll return to the music uh, aspect yeah, yeah, yeah. later. But um, I'd recorded a bunch of music, and that was the the era of mp3.com. And um, I'd purchased a new computer, and I had a converter to like, oh, I can, I can make an mp3, and started uploading stuff to um, mp3.com. And that was the first time I'd ever really made my music available outside of like making little cassette tapes for like friends and family. Um, and putting it on mp3.com and then I needed images to go with the art. So for, I got, I bought a scanner, you know, one of these ancient machines, like, you know, it scans the art. And so I scanned, uh, some of my drawings and then I got, um, an early version of Photoshop and I had to go to the, the bookstore and bought a book about, you know, how to use Photoshop and, then started messing around a little bit with sort of combining my drawings with digital aspects, um, you know, using um, background colors and background textures and um, highlighting and um, outer glow and things like that. And so I started using my old drawings and, and reworking them into digital art. And then also even I took like some hawk feathers and I would put them on the scanner and scan them. And then I'd use the hawk feathers in the art once I had like a JPEG of it. And 
that really actually that's when my relationship with the digital world really changed because prior to that i had really only ever used computers to um write papers you know i i went straight from high school to college to graduate school uh but in the year 2000 i had finished graduate school and yeah then i started digitizing my music digitizing art and then um, it was also right at that time that I had a friend who was working with Pro Tools, and he invited me over to his place to um, play some instruments on an album he was working on. And I'd never encountered like a digital recording system before. Prior to that, I had uh, like a Tascam four track recorder to record music. And he, my friend said, oh, yeah, well, you know, there's a free version of Pro Tools that you can download. I was like, oh, amazing. So I downloaded Pro Tools free and then started creating digital music at that point. And so there, just my whole relationship to the computer changed that, you know, I would only, like I said, I'd only use it to write papers. But now I was doing it for art, for music, for sharing of art, sharing of music, and also started creating music there. So I'll, I'll take a breath there because I just threw a lot of information at yeah. you. Wow. Um, seems like you've been doing this for a long time. I mean, I, I also, I go, when did you start like, um, writing music and playing instruments too? So like the, um, and, and we're, I'll put, I'll include a link by the way, to your website, which has, you know, all your albums, yeah. but I, it seems like you play the guitar and a 12 string guitar at that i know you've got some guitars behind you and some different instruments so when yeah when did when did that start for you um and how did you learn how to play yeah so way 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 back when um at some point before my parents got divorced which was when i was nine years old um my sister and i started taking some piano lessons so we were living in chico in northern california and I'm not quite sure how old we were, but my sister was a year older than I am. And we were going to these uh, piano lessons with this piano teacher. And I think we maybe had like five months of piano lessons. And then that piano teacher moved out of town. And then we got a new piano teacher. And neither my sister nor I liked this new teacher. Uh, so we stopped going. And so th that was my introduction to the quote, the piano. <laughs> as a as a little kid um and then sometime after that i don't even know when my dad got me like this little teeny tiny casio keyboard um you know this little thing that has like these these cheesy little beats built into it and these tiny little keys you know and that was like my first keyboard and then over the years my dad would buy me additional keyboards you know and every year they got a little bit better they had more sounds the sounds were better um you could do more with them and so i kind of grew up with that but i always tell people like these days like i can't pl quote unquote play the piano i'm not someone who can sit down and oh yeah i can just go for it and you know um so i say look I i'm a keyboard player I, I can play keyboards which is really different than like playing piano in that sense um so anyway, that was kind of always there. I always had like a little keyboard, but I was never too much into like actually doing anything with it other than just like messing around on it. But then for me, um, you know, as a young teenager, right around 13 or 14, um, that's when I really started getting into music in the sense of, well, prior to that, what I always liked to listen to musically was uh, the Dr. Demento show, which was this radio show. And the, Dr. Demento. <laughs> I've never and, heard of Dr. Demento. Okay. So he, he had this radio show that was syndicated and it was all just the craziest music ever. And it was all like weird parody stuff. Like the, one of these uh, songs that they play was like, um, fish heads, fish heads, roly poly fish heads, fish heads, fish heads, eat them up, yum. Right. That was one of the songs on the Dr. Demento show. And of course, like Weird Al. So actually, early on, I got into Weird Al Yankovic. Okay. I was a big Weird Weird Al fan. Yeah, I remember that as a kid. Yeah. And that was like the first real concert I ever went to was in Santa Cruz. Wow. What um, a concert seeing, to go to? 
you know oh my it was it I, was I, so I, crazy all i remember from weird al is he did the uh the coolio rap song gangsta's paradise is i think living in an amish paradise yeah living in an amish paradise or something like that i remember i i, I was obsessed with that as a, as a kid so yeah well this was um before then and so this was like the like a like a surgeon tour which was okay. a a parody of oh, Madonna's God. Like a Virgin. <laughs> and um, he was just really wacky and I really enjoyed it. So, you know, I, I've always had kind of just a funny sense of humor and I still have that funny sense of humor. So, but Weird Al wasn't like cool music. You know, that was just like, yeah, I, I like Weird Al and like the Dr. Demento show. But then a little bit after that, I started getting into, you know, as as you become more of a teenager, you start to realize that that your music is part of your quote your identity and how you fit into the larger constellation within your high school or junior high or whatever. So I started getting into alternative music because um, that's what my friends at high school or in junior high listened to. So I started getting into like Talking Heads, U2, The Cure, Depeche Mode, New Order, um, lots of British bands, British alternative rock bands, and early goth bands. And then also at the same time was kind of nurturing an interest in reggae music because, was, you know, we were living in Chico, but we would spend summers in Santa Cruz uh, where my dad would teach um, summer chemistry classes at UC Santa Cruz. And I, I was a junior lifeguard there, so I'd go down to the beach every morning and like do all this lifeguarding stuff. And I had a friend there that I would meet up with every summer. And he was really into reggae music. So he introduced me to like Bob Marley and Ziggy Marley. Um, and that was kind of my first entry into reggae music. So I started cultivating these dual interests in like alternative rock and in reggae. And at that point in time, they definitely did not go together in any way. So it was kind of these two separate worlds. And um, also I had grown up, my, my dad had done a post doctorate in Santiago, Chile before I was born. And when he came back to the United States after I was born or when I was born or before I was born, I should say, um, he brought back all these old reel to reel recordings. So kind of like if you, if you think of like an old sci-fi show with like these old computers with these big things spinning with tape on them, those yeah, are the yeah, reel to reels. Yeah. So he had all kinds of these things and they were all of South American folk music. This is like Andean folk music. So all these instruments with um, like these little guitars and lots of, you know, shakers and rattles and then all kinds of flutes that was included in that music. And that's what I grew up listening to was like the South American folk music. Um, so I also kind of had this interest in sort of world music that wasn't even called world music back then. Um, so then anyway... As the story goes, uh, we were in Santa Cruz. I think I was probably 15. I was 14 or 15 years old at the time and listening to the radio. And that summer, um, The Cure's Why Can't I Be You was out on the radio. And I think also around that time, there was Aha, Take On Me, a song I really loved. And um, the songs were playing on the radio. And I, I actually kind of had like this musical epiphany while I was listening that I was thinking like, you know what? I think I can do this, that I was listening to the music and really paying attention to how do the guitars and the keyboards and the bass guitar and the drums and the lead instruments and the rhythm instruments and the, the harmony instruments, how do they all work together to make music? So I was kind of analyzing music because I was listening to it. Mm -hmm. And then also trying to figure out reggae because um, it's like, like, what is it about reggae that makes you want to go like that? And I realized, oh, well, they're, they're doing the, the chords are on the off beat and, but the bass is playing the melody and, you know, which was just totally different than alternative rock music, you know, mm -hmm. four, four music. Um, and so I was kind of having these epiphanies and thinking like, you know what, I think I could do this. So then I started creating stuff on the, the keyboard and I, I would, I got a little tape player and I would record one little bit. So this is all before digital music, right? I, I'd re record a little bit on the keyboard and record that on the tape player. Then I'd play the tape player back and then I'd start to play along with it. And so I'd do like little bass lines and like here, here are some of the chord structures and like here's a little lead line that goes over that. 
So that's really when I started. But then as I started that next school year, um, I got an acoustic guitar. And I think that was my first year of high school. We had a th three year high school. So that was like, yeah, 15, 16, 17. I graduated when I was 17 years old. And there was um, an older kid who played guitar. He was a couple years ahead of me. And so I got this acoustic guitar and I got him to show me just a few basic chords on the guitar. And that's what got me started there. And then um, created uh, an alternative rock band in my high school, which I named Mild Euphoria because we had this class on on drugs. We had a dare class, like, a, you know, just say no to drugs class. Yeah. And um, this is also right around the time that I had first experienced cannabis. And in class, uh, marijuana said, they said that, well, it produces a mild euphoria. I was like, wow, that's a really cool name for a band. Um, so I used that term and, you know, we started this alternative rock band and we, and we played once at our high school. Um, and then also I got another new keyboard at that point. And then I started playing with a completely different group of friends and we started, uh, doing like a reggae band that never really went anywhere. We never performed anywhere, but I was kind of nursing these two different musical threads at the same time. So I'll pause there because this is the thing. Yeah. You asked me a question. I've always got lots, but I'll pause you, there. You that, see, that's how I started. largely self-taught really, right? With all, yeah. with, 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 with the guitar and all the instruments you play. Um, and then I guess last, before we go into our next subject, just about writing, you know, it seems like, when you at least from what i can see when you started to really explore entheogens especially um you know 5meo and when you really started to write about it both in nonfiction and then even from like the book i read uh the, the fiction book beyond azara right that, that you wrote it's kind of a, a a creative fiction take you know it's almost like telling the telling the story and and uh getting across the principles through fiction yeah. and you know these books are are not short books um they're well written they're well put together um there's a lot of creativity behind them um a lot of clarity behind them um and so yeah if you could just briefly address like how you got started writing um and then my follow-up question to that is going to be getting into sort of like um, I guess the main crux of this, which is like how creativity and art relate to truth and authenticity and how your journeys with, with 5MEO made you a better artist. But first, I want to hear about how the writing got started. Yeah. Oh, man. I mean, you're just asking these questions that I could just keep rambling on for days and days and days. Um, just to wrap up the music bit, I will just affirm yes i'm pretty much i'm pretty much self-taught on everything um and i'm someone i can't read music i don't know anything about music um you know i joke that sometimes other musicians are like oh well is that a seventh diminished whatever and i was like i have i have no clue i have no idea right. um and i've picked up a lot of instruments along the way so yes i do have a lot of instruments here in my house and um it's really like so one time somebody asked me like, well, if there was only one thing you could do, what would it be? Like if you had to drop everything else in your life and I right. said, Oh, well, it would, it would definitely be music that without a doubt music would, if I, if I could hold on to one thing and do that for the rest of my life, it would absolutely without question be music. Amazing. Um, so then, and, and it's something that I have continued with ever since, I first started with music. I've just been obsessed with creating music. I love, love, love creating music. It is just immensely satisfying for me. And um, it's also one of these great ironies in my life that like I mentioned earlier, like a lot of people who quote unquote know me have no clue that I'm a musician. That, and uh -huh. so my, I don't have a musical audience at all in the world um you should so i like your stuff man i, I was uh jamming out. i was actually when we first um talked about this i actually went online 
I started playing your music. I'm I'm a lawyer, and that's my job. And I was yeah. I was typing out my legal document. I was just like, man, this is this is relaxing. Like this is some good stuff. You know, it it, it I mean, I I enjoy your music. It was awesome. I mean, yeah. But keep going. <laughs> okay. Well, thank well, thank you. And I love making it, but I mostly make it for myself ultimately because I I am the audience that I'm making it for. Mm -hmm. Um, but then there, so writing, yeah, so. That the way that that started, um, so I went through graduate school, and uh, things did not go well with my advisor. Um, so for anybody who's unfamiliar with graduate school, um, once you decide on this is what I'm going to do my PhD on, is you have to get a, a graduate advisor, and that is the person who directs your research, um, and is. Ultimately, the person who's going to be responsible for whether you're going to be able to get a job when you're all done, um, because they're the ones who have to write you letters of recommendations and get you in for interviews and things like that. So this person is like absolutely crucial for a graduate student. But my graduate advisor, I can't speak for her, but I think that she started to view me as competition mm -hmm. rather than as a student to support. So she actively undermined my ability to get a job within my area of study, which was in religious studies. And I uh, specialized in Native American religious traditions. So anyway, what that meant was that when I finished graduate school, which even she delayed my finishing of graduate school by like a year and a half, that I was actually ready to be done before the year 2000, but she kept delaying even reading my dissertation and so I had to keep being a student because she just was completely dropping the ball. Um, I guess pun intended. Yeah. Um, I was say. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, what that meant is that when I finished graduate school, highly educated with a PhD in religious studies, I could not get a job within my area. And another graduate student who actually had originally taught me how to play the didgeridoo, I had met him early on in my time as a graduate student. He was teaching English at a school for international students in Santa Barbara. And he said, oh, well, you should come, come teach English. And so I went to this school and the director of the school was the former girlfriend of another student who had worked with the same professor at UC Santa Barbara as myself. And she was like, Martin, what in the hell are you doing here? What, why are you coming to teach English at this little rinky dink school? And I just said, well, I had some issues with my advisor and she's like, oh, oh yeah, I get it because I was not the only one who had been screwed over by this professor. And so then she immediately gave me a job, um, teaching English. But what that meant is that I was teaching like really basic English to international students. And it was not using any of my mental capacity or time in any way other than going to teach and like, how do I get to the beach? You know, really yeah. basic stuff. Um, so I had a lot of free time at that point. And I had not read a novel maybe since high school at that point because I had been a, a student and hardcore, like lots and lots of academic reading. But I remember that I had read... Um, I had read part of Lord of the Rings when I was younger and I had read the first Dune book and it's like, well, I don't know what to read for fiction. So I'll, I'll just start there. So I started, I reread the first Dune book and then read the entire series and then went on to, I read the Silmarillion and the Hobbit and then the Lord of the Rings. And then upon finishing the Lord of the Rings, I just had this overwhelming urge. It's like, you know what? I want to write a fantasy epic. And I, at that time, I was kind of thinking, well, maybe this will be my way out, that I, I can't teach in academics because my advisor screwed me over, mm -hmm. but maybe I can be a novelist or something. And that's what got me started, is I started writing what became the Tales of Arduin series, which I just finished the audiobook for book two, on that like yesterday but um that's a four book series and i just i just started working on it um it was actually at night 
which was the wrong way to go because I have troubles with insomnia and sleeping. But anyway, so it was like yeah, it was like 10 p.m. on a Tuesday night. I just started writing this novel that became Orvai's Vision. And what I ended up doing in in that book and then the subsequent books that followed in Tales of Arduin was kind of taking everything that I had learned as a graduate student studying different religions, um, also as a philosophy student, and I also put all kinds of my own um, experiences with salvia divinorum and psilocybin mushrooms. I put those into the books in terms of the characters' experiences that they were having or just things that they were learning. And so kind of use that as an outlet to kind of express like, well, man, I spent years studying all this stuff, but I haven't had an outlet to share any of it. Right. And so that's how I got started writing. And, you know, sometimes people pick up my book, Mushroom Wisdom, which was published in 2006. And they tell me, oh, yeah, I've read your first book. And I said, well, actually, that's my fifth book. That wow. And to create Mushroom Wisdom, after I'd written these books, Tales of Arduin, which is, I, I brought them over. So there's these three books or four books, excuse me, right here. After I wrote these. So cool. I realized that I had put everything that I'd ever learned from psilocybin mushrooms into these books. Right in books. And so then Mushroom Wisdom, I wrote that book very, very quickly. And there's passages in Mushroom Wisdom that are almost word for word identical for what's in the Tales of Arduin series. Right. Um, so I just kind of extracted that. It's like I had already written it, but I just needed to extract it and reformat it. And then that became my book, Mushroom Wisdom. And then that started me publishing and writing about entheogens from a nonfiction perspective. Okay, so the so the fiction really prompted the yes. nonfiction. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, and these, you know, as with most of my books, these are self-published, and um, this is another area where most people who read my nonfiction books, they have no idea that I've written six novels and that. Um, Honestly, they're some of my favorite books because it, as you say, it's a way that I have put everything that I've learned from my entheogenic experiences and my position on non-duality and self-transformation and authenticity. Um, and also there's lots of stuff about music in the books, especially these books, the Tales of Arduin books, that there's so much about music that's mm -hmm. in there. Um, and all of my novels have aspects that are autobiographical, but they're kind of hidden because the, there might be split between multiple different characters. Right. Um, but it's been a way for me to express and communicate some of these ideas, but put it into story form and make it very fantastic and make it hopefully very entertaining. And I really love my characters and the situations that I've created. And then um, a lot of times, the, it's interesting that the novels have had to come first. Like I said, that I wrote all this stuff about mushrooms in Tales of Arduin, and then, oh, I can write a book about mushrooms, that that gave me the material then to write a book about mushrooms. Right. And then with um, Beyond the Zara, that this is even more autobiographical. And after I wrote Beyond the Zara, then I felt like, okay, now I can actually write my own story, which is my memoir, Being Infinite, um, but I had to write Beyond Azara first. I had to put it into story form first. Yeah. And then a little bit later, a couple of years later, I wrote my book, The Solandarian Game. And this is where I start to really distinguish about how to work with 5-MeO-DMT and what is sort of this non-dual energetic perspective that I have about 5-MeO-DMT. And then after that is when I wrote my book, In Theogenic Liberation, where I'd, I had already talked about a lot of this stuff and put it into the Solandarian game. Right. And it's that's kind of, it just, it just seems to be how I work, that first I want to express stuff creatively, and then I'm ready for, okay, I'll do the, quote, academic thing or the nonfiction thing. That's cool, man. Well, that's a perfect kind of lead into my kind of uh, next question, which is like, one like what is the relationship in your mind right between authentic being and art right and what what does creativity and art have to do with truth and authenticity and how did 
your journey and the insights you gained, you know, with with five meo, and we can talk about you know non duality and feel free to go wherever you want. But like, how did that inform being an artist, and how did that help you get over? You know, let, let's just start there. Let's just start there. Before I, I was going to add a second, I was going to add a a one B to that question, but let's leave it right there. Yeah. Well, e even from my earliest experiences, and here I, I would go to cannabis. Um, so this is kind of circling back around to earlier in our conversation that um, early on in high school, I had an opportunity to get just shit face drunk, and. I realized after that, I was like, I don't think I ever want to do that again because it just made me feel dumb. It made me feel numb. And obviously, you know, the ego just goes into, oh, you know, goes into these things, which I didn't like. And then I got to try cannabis and I was like, you know what? I'm actually really inspired to write poetry. I'm inspired to make drawings. I'm inspired to make music and then listening to music or looking at art after consuming cannabis was just so incredible. And then going out into nature and it's like, oh yeah, I'm just, I feel so inspired. And also from my early experiences with psilocybin mushrooms, I just felt very, very inspired. Like, like all of reality is this, is this work of art and it's all just continually being expressed and it's unfolding. It's all these energies that are taking shape and coalescing and then giving birth to form. And then the communication of meaning through symbols and through shapes and through colors and textures and sounds and all of this, that I was just enlivened as a creator through my experiences with psychedelics and mind altering substances. And it made me want to create more. And it made me, you know, get into this question of like, how, how do I communicate these feelings and these insights? How do I communicate it through art or through music or through expression? And then especially, as you mentioned, getting into 5-MeO DMT, it was just like the revelation of, okay, this is the true nature of reality. And so how, how can I communicate that in a way that is direct and is authentic and also hopefully inspiring to others? Um, so my, my psychedelic experiences have always pushed me more towards creativity. You know, there's even a, there's a little section somewhere here in Mushroom Wisdom. It's been a long time since I've looked at it, but I just get into this like, create, 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 you know, like that's what you got to do. Like if, if you want to vibe into the, the mushrooms and what the mushrooms have to offer, you got to start creating stuff. You got to make stuff. Um, and the idea that using art, using music, using stories that kind of going back to what you said before, that not everyone's comfortable with like, oh, let's talk about psychedelics. But if you can show them a piece of art and they're like, wow, what inspired that? Or share a piece of music and have, whoa, like that made me feel at peace or relaxed or open or whatever it was, or a story that like captures people's imagination and also challenges them and helps them look at the world and think about things in a different way. Like one of the things that I've always said about religion is one of my biggest problems with religion is that most of our quote unquote religious stories occurred in a historical time period where we didn't have this distinction between nonfiction and fiction. And so when people read a religious story, they think, oh, did this really happen? Is this true? You know, we have people who are very literalist with the Bible and said, all, all this is literally true. And my approach is, no, well, it's all just literature. It's just fiction. And it's really, if we want to look at it as literally true, that we're missing the point that it's, maybe it's trying to communicate something through characters, through stories, through these events that are described within the stories, um, and that we can still, we can use fiction to reveal truth. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the, the um, a little bit of the approach of actually um, Jordan Peterson, even though, you know, he's, he, he did um, a whole series on the, on the Bible, and he kind of did that where he was kind of like showing him as a psychologist how these different stories yeah. are pointing to you know certain truths like through or underneath these stories are communicating something about about the human experience and about you know grappling with the unknown or different things like that it's 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 actually pretty interesting 
Um, but um, yeah, I mean, like for me as a singer too, um, being yourself, right? Like mm. I got actually into trouble with my voice when I was younger, trying to make it into something else, trying to sound like other people or having an, uh, an image about how I wanted my voice to sound. Um, and all that stuff is actually a, a kind of distraction yeah. and, and actually makes you a, a worse singer. And you'll come off ultimately as fake and you won't quite last. And as I've gotten older, and more experienced and definitely you know my experiences with 5meo helped lock this in is just this being comfortable like the relationship between truth being comfortable in your own skin in other words like being being with my voice as it is not trying to push it to be more not trying to make it less like just being with what is so truth being with what it is being with what is and creating yeah. you know, and being an effective creator and i found that those i guess three elements were very much related um so what do you think about that about about you know self-authenticity and how that relates to sort of the nature of reality and what entheogens can teach you and then taking that to inform your art. Yeah. So authenticity, the way that I would describe that is that the, and this is where it relates to psychedelic experience, because psychedelic experience is all about altering our relationship to perception of an experience of the energy of being. So our thoughts, our emotions, our tactile sensations, what we see, what we hear, how we process it. These are all aspects of energy. And so authenticity is the output that you are making is congruent and resonant with what you're actually feeling inside. And the liberation aspect would be that um, through the constructs of the ego, by trying to be what we think we're supposed to be or what we think other people want us to be, is that we ultimately box ourselves in in terms of our own energetic expression, that we edit and we censor ourselves. We tell people what we think they want to hear. We try and be the person that other people want us to be. Or for many different artists and musicians and people who create, it's all about pleasing their audience or pleasing their label or pleasing the producers and, you know, putting on a show that might not be authentic for you, but is what is being required of you yeah. because it's part of your job. Like as a singer, right? Like, you know, going to an audition and being like, well, I hope they like my voice. You know, I, 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 I hope they like me. I hope they like me. And it's kind of like this, I hope they like me kind of thing is, um, man, it, 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 it's not, it, it's not in my opinion, the, the best place to kind of come from right when yeah. you're when you're doing something um and what the to me what the nature of reality or, or having a direct experience of that showed me was that hey you know i'm okay as i am yeah you know i'm i'm okay as i am and it made me less desperate for things. And in being less desperate for things, I was able to uh, start to express more authentically. Um, and it's like, it's like a lot of times I realized that my energy for wanting to be a singer was like, oh, I want to achieve this thing that if I yeah. get that, it will make my life okay. Yeah, you know, and yeah. there's a real balance between between kind of uh, really weird, but there there's a there's like kind of two ways to be ambitious, right? There's I'm ambitious and I'm people pleasing, like I'm not satisfied with myself, and therefore being ambitious to get something, right? Right. 
different. It, 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 it can like hard to tell from the outside, but internally a different experience, right? But the alternative or, or sort of the, the different way is like, hey, I'm completely confident in who I am. I love to do this. I'm going out and performing and I'm being ambitious and I'm doing it from a place of of strength, from a place of confidence, from a from a yeah. from a from a maturity. Um and these are two different things to me. And I and I've been in both places and I struggled in the former place for basically my entire life, you know? And and man, it's like that's a tough place to be in, and that's a tough place to be in as an artist. Because you said something to me that that like really hit home, which was like, "I'm making this music for me, right? I'm making this music for not to please other people, right?" And the biggest thing is, and as an artist, it's like this: it can be this inbred feeling of, you know, fear of judgment from others, rejection. Do people like it? Uh, self-criticism you know and what I found was that I knew I had this part of me that was afraid that was critical um, that was uh, fearing of what people would judge and then I would have this part of me that wouldn't like it be like man I want to try to talk myself out of it Um, can I fight it can I pretend to be confident all this different stuff like that and that never worked. It was always yeah. like one part of me fighting the other part of me. Yeah. And what I found was something very, very different that getting, you know, getting to the root source of this duality between I'm really, I'm not feeling confident. I'm feeling like I'm afraid of being criticized. I want people to like my work. If they don't like my work, I'm getting up, I'm getting upset and depressed. And then this part of me that doesn't like it wants to be confident, right? That the that the root of that of that problem lies in our nature. And serious work with 5MEO DMT and also you know other things in my life led me to sort of unpack right the, the root source of yeah. that conflict, right? Which is which is which is me, which is what, what I am, what, what my nature is. Um, that's how it affected me. I, I would love to hear some of your experiences about that whole topic that I spoke about, you know, fear of judgment, uh, criticism, uh, wanting other people to like your work. They don't like it. But, but just like finding what seems to be this confidence in you of like, I'm going to make this art. I'm going to produce what I produce. And if people like it, great. If they don't, fine. But it's like, I'm doing this for a reason that's sort of like, maybe includes that, but also transcends it. Yeah. Yeah. So all of what you're talking about is this, this question of, am I really being authentic with my energy or am I working from these various constructs that I've built up within my head and around my expectations and around my desires and around my relationships to others um, and how my work may or may not be received versus coming from that place of, look, this is just me. Look, this is just, this is what I think. This is what I feel. This is what I know in my heart to be true. And I'm going to share it. And that's what really drives me is this overwhelming urge and energy to create, to share, and just to be open and honest about it. And that applies to whether I am um, taking photographs or making art or making music or writing a novel or writing a nonfiction book. I mean, certainly uh, things you mentioned that uh, there are people out there who are very critical of things that I have shared. There are people who really like to not like me. um, And to uh, want to erase me in certain ways. Um, But that doesn't change my message. It doesn't change what I have to share because it's coming from a place of knowing myself, loving myself, and loving the process of taking everything that I feel inside and 
putting it out there in one form or another through these multiple different formats and using them as avenues of expression. And, you know, when it comes to specifically when it comes to music, um, I refer to my own music as shape shifting music because I've never tried to be a particular genre or particular style of musician. So it's an area of my life where I've really given myself complete freedom to, well, if I want to learn how to play an instrument, well, then I'll go get it and pick it up. And if I want to incorporate these different sounds from this culture or that culture, you know, I'll do it. I'll use it. Um, that I've just allowed myself to be very, very free with music. And so for me, it's just this absolute love and joy. And of course, there's that element of, well, I hope other people like it because of, you know, anyone who creates stuff, you create stuff through that desire to share it for the most part. I mean, there are some artists who are just like, oh, I'm making stuff and stashing it away. I'm never going to share it to anyone. But a lot of times those are also people who are afraid of what other people might think of it. Yep. So they're kind of coming from that place. Whereas I'm just, no, I'm just going to make it. And, you know, I, I hope that other people will enjoy it. But it's my own standard. Like I want to make music that I want to listen to. I want to make music that's going to move me and hopefully it will move other people. And so, and this, this is also a nice area where writing fiction is just such a beautiful area because, you know, most of my fiction books, they fit within, you know, the broader categories of like science fiction and fantasy so that you can have complete freedom there to make things the way that you want and give yourself the freedom to express the things that you want. And, you know, I've of course been interested in creating interesting characters, interesting backstories, interesting context, but I've also used the novels as a medium to express all these other things that I'm also feeling about. This is the nature of authenticity. This is the nature of reality. This is the relevance of psychedelic experience. You know, all of my novels have consumption of psychedelics in them in, in one place or another, and sometimes in multiple places. Mm -hmm. um, and just coming from that place of both inner and external freedom. And again, that term authenticity where the energetic output that I am producing is consistent with my internal energetic environment. And so, you know, this is one of the things that a lot of people say when they hear me speak, that they say that they can hear my authenticity. They can hear that I'm I'm speaking truthfully. Even if they don't agree with me, they're like, well, he, he certainly is, is being authentic about what he's expressing. And I try and bring that into everything that I do. And it's like kind of where I started that I personally self-identify more as an artist and a creator than as really anything else. And so I kind of view everything as sort of an ongoing, extended, multi-layered art project that I am taking my passion and producing things with it and hoping that it has an impact on others, that they are receptive of what I have to share. And also knowing that since I'm not really trying to please anyone other than myself and my own sense of, was I authentic when I did that, that certain people will resonate very strongly with what I produce and that others, it's not going to work for them, but they are not my concern that I am not trying to write a best-selling book. I'm not trying to create a number one hit song. I'm not trying to create the most revered piece of art ever. I'm just trying to tap in to what inspires me and how can I create something around that and share that with others that hopefully is received in a way that that people feel that they've gotten something from it no, and are able to enjoy it. I mean, I think the biggest thing that I hear is just something that actually people struggle with um, a lot and it's something I struggled with, which is just being comfortable in your own skin, right? Yeah. It sounds like a very simple concept, but actually can be quite hard to actually live. And and um, and I think that, and I'm sure you've, you know, we've spoken about this before, but getting comfortable with what and who I am existentially. Yeah. 
allowed me to get a lot gave me the space to allow that allowed me to get more comfortable with who I am as a person. And the thing is like, in order to be authentic, in order to let your true energy, in my opinion, come through, it's, it's a, it's a risk taking endeavor. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not, it's, it's a, it's a game of being open of, of not protecting yourself. Yeah. Because if I fake it and someone doesn't like it, or if I kind of protect myself, well, then it's not really me. But if I really say what I think, if I'm authentic, you know, and come from that place and and put it out there, you know, and you put some stuff out there in terms of what you written in your wrote in your books and 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 um you know, exp- you could say I experiencing yourself or uh, me experiencing yeah. myself as infinite, right? And people mm-hmm. go, "What?" That's kind of crazy, yeah. you know, yeah. but, and, and someone can say you're nuts. But when you're able to do that, it's a little bit like an ego death because it's like I can put myself out there and you can stab me. But because I've kind of transcended my ego in a way, it doesn't really hurt me. You know, I'm not so identified anymore with that with that character that can get hurt or uh is afraid of what people might think not that you don't have feelings and don't yeah. and don't feel what people say i'm not saying that but it's possible to transcend and include in other words it's possible to have those feelings you know all of those feelings and feel them more fully than you ever could have could have before you know yet have transcended them such that you can put your ass on the line with what you're doing and with what you're trying to say and with the art that you're creating. Um, and that's powerful. And in my opinion, it's fun. Right. And it's where, and it's where the, the juice of the, of the journey, you know, really is. So, um, yeah. Any, any, any thoughts on, on what I just said there? I'm sharing a little bit more about about what I, what I've experienced as well. So as an artist. Yeah. Well, it, it really is for me, it's coming from this place, as you say, of just really being open and honest and authentic and um, being willing. You know, one of the things I write about in a lot of my books, I say, look, you are free to be yourself. And in doing that, it's important to understand that not everyone is going to like it and that it doesn't mean that everything's just going to go your way. And it doesn't mean that Um, Because, you know, sometimes people have these really kind of convoluted ideas like, oh, well, if I could just discover myself and just be myself, then I will be able to manifest everything that I want in my life and it will all be beautiful and good. And and I just come from the position of, look, it just does not work that way. That if you are really allowing yourself to be free and open and vulnerable, that it means that you're not really playing the same games that other people are playing and that certain people are going to get very, very angry that you are not playing their game and they're going to do everything that they can to try and box you into their game. But if you're coming from this place of self-knowledge and self-acceptance and self-love, for me, that is the most important thing. Not if I am pleasing other people or, um, appeasing their judgment or um, trying to fit into their categories of what they think is right or wrong or good or bad or uh, worthwhile or not worthwhile, but coming from this place of, look, I am confident in who I am and I am confident in what I have to share. And I'm willing to risk that other people might hate me for it and they might really not like me for it. But that ultimately is not going to change me because, as you say, it is kind of like an ego death. And it still is hurtful, you know, that I have suffered through some very public campaigns of people really wanting to box me into their judgment and category. Um, And it has not been pleasant to live through in any way, shape or form. And it does hurt. But it does not stop me and it does not make me turn. It doesn't make me cower and say, oh, well, I've I've really got to be what other people want me to be because I am only interested in being true to myself. 
and yeah. hopefully inspiring others to do the same. That's yeah, and, that's that's a big part of what and motivates. That's, and that's what sharing. kind of any any um you know a, a powerful position to take in life, and and the people that have you know made impacts generally generally do that. And that kind of that kind of brings me actually to my my final question to you as we um wrap up here is you talked about the practical you know and a lot of people that experience entheogens or or get into spirituality or uh get into that stuff right it's like wow i've experienced that that i'm i'm infinite right yeah. that my nature is unbounded yet wow i'm still in this world man i gotta show up for work the next day some guy might not like it. I've got, you know, all the all the practical things to deal with. And a lot of people, I think, fear that, oh, well, if I go into, you know, spiritual land, I, I, I won't be able to do the practical, right? I won't be able to do the day-to-day -day life stuff. And what I see from you is you're a guy that works hard. I mean, it's impossible to write all those books, okay? without a lot of work painstaking attention to the actual practical detail right editing you know proofreading you know quote unquote boring mundane things yeah. you know not 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 you know the the grand spiritual experiences right and i know like you know you created art um that represented difficult times in your life and you've yeah learn to play all these instruments and you put all this stuff together on the computer and that takes work right and that takes a lot of attention to detail um and for me right like i, I i'm a lawyer i mean i've got to sit there and 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 dot on my eyes check all my you know check all my periods and make sure things are done correctly um as well and so i kind of wanted you to talk about that and maybe bridge this gap right that that people i think might be a misconception uh between the sort of duality of this okay i want to escape i want to have the grand spiritual spiritual experience and oh i'm kind of back in my real life and you seem to have been able to uh bridge that gap uh in your work so i, I would love if you address that yeah well one of the most interesting things about the infinite nature of being is that it is through the imposed limitations and attention to detail that we get anything at all. So, you know, from my non-dual position is that all of reality is just one being interacting with and experiencing itself. But then for me, it's a very interesting question of, like, well, how does it do that? Well, it does that through these fractal energetic structures that allow for reality and aspects of reality to interact with itself in order to create coherent structures. And even the word universe means like the one song. So this universe that we live in is this song that's being played. And just like a piece of music, it has certain elements that are structural, that are necessary. And then there's certain amount of freedom, such as bringing in your melody or bringing in your harmony, that you have certain amount of freedom to move within those structures. And so it, it's all related in the sense that Everything that has form has various limitations within it. And that includes my life, that I am in the human form as Martin, and I have a limited amount of time to work with, and I have a limited amount of capability to work with within that limited time. And so it's all about working within the limited structures of the infinite, right? That we, when we go to music or go to sound, we could just go for the, for the all sound. So this is something that I and, and other people have heard um, in their entheogenic experiences where you hear this sound and there's just a sense of like, this is the primordial sound, like everything else comes from this sound. But then we can take the practical question of, well, can I make a song that is not this universal one sound, but somehow is an expression of that? that has that same sense of energy to it. It has that same sense of creativeness and of becoming to it. So it's by working within the limits and applying ourselves within the limits that we're able to achieve anything. And, and again, that's what our life is, that our life is framed by birth and death 
And we only have so much time to really get to know ourselves and to express ourselves. And I am the kind of person where I, I don't really ever just sit around and not do anything that I, I love projects. I love creating. I love working on all the little bits and pieces of it. I just get a lot of satisfaction from that because for me, that is the application of infinite potential into creating something actual. And, you know, I could sit around and say, Oh, I've, I've got a lot of ideas for music and it's like, okay, great. You know, we'll do something about it. And, you know, for me, the way that the process works is that it actually sort of builds up. So my most recent project was, was taking this one here, the second book in the Tales of Arduin series. Oh, just dropped a book on the floor. So this is The Fate of Marani. And I started this on January 30th of recording the audio, you know, the spoken bits for the book. And then the next part of the project was, okay, now I'm going to create an album of music that's going to fit into the audio book that's kind of like a soundtrack. Um and I hadn't made any music since my last album that I produced, which was The Pure Energy of Unconditional Love, which is an album that I made to go with this book, the Facilitating 5-MeO DMT yeah. audio book. And I've just been, I've been itching and waiting. It's like, oh, I can't wait to make music. I can't wait to, can't do it. But I've got to wait because I'm trying to record all the audio bits first. Yeah. And so working within a limit. And then once I got all those audio bits recorded, it's like, okay, now it's open for music. And then it was just like opening these floodgates. And over the course of three weeks, um, I recorded 14 brand new songs and recorded this album, The Fate of Marani, the soundtrack. And then even, even there, you know, my method is then to take some psychedelics and then listen back to the music to see like, do I really like what I've produced here? And then just over the past couple of days, I was incorporating the music back into the spoken bits of the audiobook and choosing which songs go with which chapters, and that there are places where I've actually put the music underneath the spoken parts so that there's this musical atmosphere that's taking place and it's reflecting what's going on in the story. Um, and then just yesterday, I bounced down all of those chapters and uploaded them to Audible for distribution. And I just, I enjoy all these different steps. And I even enjoy the waiting of like, okay, like next week I get to play music. Like it's going to be so much fun. Mm -hmm. And just even, you know, I wrote this book originally, it was over 20 years ago that I wrote this novel, but oh. it's still an ongoing artistic project for me. And I still have two more books in the series to do. And so that's what I mean that I kind of look at everything as like this ongoing artistic project. And with all of my books, um, you know, I make the art for the covers and I make the art that goes in the inside. And then some of them, I include lyrics that come directly out of my five MEO experiences, such as an entheogenic liberation. Oh, th this one cracks me up. Um, that I had someone who was reading in Theogenic Liberation. Mm -hmm. And I've got a bunch of lyrics that I've included in there. Um, and these were songs that I wrote about the 5-MEO experience that I was having my wife, Jessalyn, sing and that we recorded together. And this is what I mean by that people don't always connect all the dots. That I, Someone wrote me and said, oh, well, I read your book in Theogenic Liberation. And then I, I found a song that had the same lyrics that you included in the book. Well, wasn't that amazing? It's like, well, who do you think made all of that? <laughs> yeah, wow. <laughs> I did. Talk about, you know, you know people, um, uh, you know, uh, boxing boxing things into something they can uh, identify. And we're a lot more, you know, broad than that. And that's what something's really cool about you is you've got a, you've got a huge mix of, of, uh, of things that you do. And I love what you said about, about the limitations too, because it's like the, you know, doing the day to day stuff and, and enjoying the limitations, right? Because that's how we get to experience anything yeah. is, is just as important as the, as the grandest, um, you know, spiritual experience, uh, and that the, you know, the granular things on the page are actually really in their nature, just as infinite as the, as the, as the infinite one itself, you know, yeah. it's like, I, I, um, it's funny. I was, I was at uh, Yom Kippur services. I, I'm Jewish with my dad and I've, I've spoken to him about some of, some of this stuff. 
And in the in the book, right, for Passover, I mean, not, not Yom Kippur, right? It's saying something like about, you know, God speaking. And then it says, I alone am, right? Like that's what it says in the book, Yeah. right? So I, I showed my dad, I'm like, what do you think this means, right? It's, it's saying right there, like, I yeah. alone am. If I alone am, then what is everything around you? Yeah. What are you? Yeah. Right. Like when you talk about the the uh real, like the the where some of the religious stuff is is pointing you, you know, and and a lot of that stuff kind of gets um you know over uh I, I guess not not necessarily recognized by by uh, by people, um, but it's there. Um, but I just think it's really important. I know I found in my life, like just, you know, being, being great with where I am and what's going on around me. And even the quote unquote unpleasant things that I don't like, don't like doing, you know, and kind of, um, really being able to sort of and this has happened for me recently kind of start to transcend some of those things yeah you know has just opened up a freedom for me in my life that that i'm really looking forward to you know like i i think we've spoken before about how i wasn't really into the law and i really liked singing and actually i've started to really turn that around where it's like I can actually do this law thing just as well. And the fact that I can do that actually helps me do the thing I quote yeah. unquote like yeah. even better, you know, because I'm not, because, because, because I'm more settled in my person, it right. matters to me less about having to have the things around me be a certain way mm. in order for me to be happy and that helps me to be a better artist you know and to be a better singer and to i think develop my voice going forward in a in a way that will make art making much more uh uh pleasurable for me so Martin, I, I, that's what I have to say. I'll give you the final, you know, word here before we wrap up. But would love to hear um, your final impressions. Yeah, well, I would just say, kind of what you're describing there is kind of moving from the "I have to do this" mindset to "Oh, well, I get to do this." Actually, I get to be a lawyer, and it's up to me whether I allow myself to be myself as a lawyer. And the more I am myself as a lawyer then the more I'm going to be myself as a musician, because then it's not just an escape. It's not just a little side hustle, but that, that question of how do I be myself? That's something that we should be bringing to everything that we're doing, because of course, within the fractal nature of reality, all the little things that we do are reflections of the big things that we do and vice versa. So the, the more we be ourselves with any given thing that we do, the more we are universally ourselves and the more we are open to that authenticity and that that deeper connection of energy that we feel within ourselves that then we are sharing with others. And again, if we can look at everything as sort of this creative process that everything is energy coming into being. So what am I bringing into my work? What am I bringing into my play? What am I bringing into my creativity? What is it that I'm sharing? And that if, if, you know, if people are creating art so that they can be famous, then there's they're putting a lot of pressure on themselves. Do so I've got to be this thing versus, look, I just love doing it. And man, I hope someone somewhere along the way, you know, picks it up and says, I love that. And we something that people who are creative all hope for is to be able to make a living from the creativity. Um, and sometimes that happens and sometimes it doesn't. Um, and then I've seen a lot of people who are artists get kind of, stuck in the, I've got to make more money around it because if we live in a monetary economy. So that's something real, but then it saps the joy out of it for people. But I don't think that, um, being into psychedelics or being into non-duality, being into the infinite expanse of nature of being in any way overrides or dissociates us from the joy of actually doing the things that we do and being the person that we are. I mean, for me, what it did is help 
me feel absolute freedom just to be myself and to look at everything as an opportunity for discovery and expression and to really just keep keep following my passion regardless of what it brings me because the deepest thing it could ever bring me is a sense of satisfaction that I'm being myself. Like this is one of the lines that I like to use with people. Um, you know, when I'm doing like integration calls or something like that, it's like, well, do you want to be on your deathbed and you want to say, well, I did all the things I was supposed to do and, you know, other people praised me for it. Or do you want to be on your deathbed and say, wow, I'm really glad I spent my life like really being myself and giving myself that permission. And most people choose the, the second option. And that's where I try and live my life from. And I look forward to every opportunity to share music, to share art. And I'm just so happy that you asked me onto this podcast to discuss these topics today. Cause, and I could just keep going for hours and hours and oh, hours yeah. about all of this. Cause <laughs> I haven't, I haven't really no, answered I... most of your questions because there's so much to it, but we might um, have to do a part two then at some point. So, yeah. But I just, I really love it. And, you know, I hope that anybody who's listening to this, I hope if they go and check out some of my music or check out some of my art or check out any of my books or particularly my novels, um, you know, I, that would make me happy because these, you know, again, as we were just discussing that often, you know, as a quote unquote public figure, I, I don't really consider myself a public figure, but I, in some ways I sort of am, um, most mostly people want to put you into one category or another. So most people, when they look at me, they say, oh, you're the guy who writes those books about 5-MeO-DMT and non-duality. And yes, I do that. But I, there's a lot of other things that I do. There's a lot more to who I am as a person. And there's a lot more that I've put out. And I would love it if more people read my novels and more people were enjoying my music. But I'm going to keep doing it um, anyway, because... If I don't, then I won't be satisfied with myself. And that's my main priority is to live my life from a place where am I satisfied that I'm being myself and and using the talents and abilities that I have and even challenging myself. Can I make an album that's that I personally think is better than the last one? Can I write a new book that I think is better? Can I explore new areas in art that I haven't before? Can I incorporate new sounds and music that I haven't before? That's my own personal challenge is just to keep growing and to keep expressing. So well, yeah, Martin, thank you again. I mean, that was honestly so well put. I mean, wow. Um, we will definitely link to all of your uh, music in the in the uh below and this is on on youtube so everybody check that out and um you know martin honestly thank you so much for sharing uh your truth and authenticity with me here today and for also you know being there and for helping me uh on my journey um and for all the uh, all the work that you put out there um you know thank you i appreciate it and thank you for being with me today yeah well thank you adam and actually I would just add one last thing about music that um, one of one of the ironic banes of my existence is that um, I when I first started distributing music through CD Baby, that was in 2006. And there was another Martin Ball who released an album through CD Baby in 2005. And my music has forever been looped in with his in the Internet. Oh um, and, and his album is called come, come to the throne. It's an album of Christian praise and worship music. <laughs> and my music has, because his album came out one year before mine, my music has always gotten lumped with him. So if anybody who's listening or, or watching or, or, you know, going to go check out my music, just know that my music is mixed with his, but I am not Martin come to the throne ball. I'm <laughs> all the music with the psychedelic covers. That's mine. <laughs> oh my God. All right, man. All right. I'll, thank you so much, Martin. I appreciate it. All right. It's been great all speaking right. with you. Thank you. you too. Bye.